Hello and welcome to this series of lectures on how to make LC3. I'm Karen Skrona from EPFL in Switzerland and... Mi nombre es Fernando Martirena, soy de la Universidad Central de Las Villas en Cuba. So we're going to make two versions of these lectures, one which I'm going to talk in, which is in English. Y la otra será en el idioma español que la voy a realizar yo. To start this lecture, just a few words about the context. So cementitious materials actually have very low environmental impact compared to alternatives, but because they're used in such really huge amounts, more than half of all man-made materials, this means they account for more than 5 to 8% of CO2 emissions uh, annually. So a good solution to lower these CO2 uh, uh, emissions is to replace part of the cement clinker by uh, supplementary cementitious materials. Now, that's a very good strategy, but unfortunately the most popular SEMs, that's to say blast furnace slag and fly ash, are in relatively short supply. Both together, they account for about 15% of cement production. So clays, which may be activated by calcination, are very interesting because this is really the only resource which is available in this kind of very large quantities we need, which can extend this supply of SEMs. So what is LC3? So particularly interesting are when you can add calcine clay together with limestone. And this is why we take this name LC3, which stands for limestone calcine clay cements. And the LC3 project brings together partners in Switzerland, Cuba and India to support the uptake of this technology. And this project has been fi financial support from SDC, which is the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And this is important because widespread adoption of LC3 technology has the potential to reduce worldwide CO2 emissions by more than 400 million tons a year. Looking at what LC3 is, the graph here shows different proportions. So in a conventional type 1 Uh, Portland cement, we would have about 95% clinker and 5% gypsum. Now, calcine clay has been known for a long time to be pozzolanic in the same way that fly ashes are, for example. And this is what we mean by a PPC 30, where typically you would, you would replace 30% of the clinker by the calcine clay. But by using this coupled addition of limestone together with calcine clay, we can go to much higher levels of addition. So for example, in this LC350 formulation, where we have 50% of clinker, 30% of calcine clay, and 15% of limestone, uh, we can see on the right-hand side here that we have similar strengths developing from seven days onwards. Now, this is the what we see as the optimum kind of level of substitution, but also it's possible to make lower levels of substitution, for example, LC365. And in these formulations, the figure denotes the amount of clinker. Now, if we look at the comparison on the right here between ordinary Portland cement and LC350, we've got 50% less clinker, This means the 30% less CO2. Of course, we take into account the energy for calcination of the clays. We have similar strength uh, from about seven days. Much better chloride resistance, which is extremely interesting, for example, in marine environments. We can almost eliminate uh, alkali silica reaction and a number of other advantages. So this isn't just an idea that's a few academics have put together. We've really taken this technology uh, into the full scale. We've made full scale trials in both Cuba and India. The pictures here show the production that was done in Cuba in tw uh, 2013, production in a rotary kiln used for making Portland cement, uh, production of blocks in a factory where the same workers just took the cement and used in one-to-one -one replacement, and here production of uh, reinforced concrete. And here was a house that was constructed with these products in Santa Clara uh, in Cuba. So now in this lecture, 
In this series of lectures, the first one we're going to, after this introduction, is going to be about surveying the clay quarry. Then in lecture two, we're going to talk about assessing the kaolinite content, which is very important. In lecture three, we're going to talk about the activation and the best temperature window for that. Our four will, lecture four will introduce this so-called R3 test, which is a very convenient test for testing clay reactivity. Lecture five, we'll talk about grinding. And lecture six, about how you put all the components together to get the optimal performance. Why do we talk about kaolinite? Well, as we see here on the right, the fa main factor determining the development of strength is the kaolinite content of the clay. And the rest of the parameters, such as surface area, such as secondary minerals, etc., have relatively little uh, influence on the reactivity. So we're going to talk a lot about kaolinite content, how to measure it, because this is the main indicator for the clay's uh, suitability. And the kind of clays which contain kaolinite are very, very widely distributed uh, around the world. All of this central region of the world here, particularly where we see the colors uh, pink and yellow, we, are com we know that there we will find uh, kaolinite, kaolinitic clays which are very suitable for this technology. And what we see is that the countries where we're likely to find suitable clays really coincide with those countries where the consumption of cement is the highest, China, India, uh, South America and Africa. So these are the points we're going to develop uh, in this series of lectures. If you want to get uh, more information, please go to our website, www.lc3.ch, or there's a very nice little short video on YouTube called Minute LC3. So thank you, and we'll come back to you for the next lecture.